Good evening and welcome to our continued focus from the World Economic Forum here in Davos, Switzerland. We've got some exclusive interviews coming up for you, the Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister Kamal Nath. Also, the CMD of SpiceJet, Ajay Singh, joins us on this program and also the investor, Asha Jadeja, somebody who has spent a lot of money in investing in Indian startups, particularly in the IT sector. But today, the big story which is coming out is the concern, and it's a global concern, on the state of India's democracy. This is playing out over here in Davos as well, with CEOs apparently asking uh, what exactly is happening as far as Indian democracy is concerned. Now, the Economist Intelligence Unit has come out with its latest study, which says that India has dropped 10 places in the democracy index of 2019. We are ranked 51st out of 165 states and at 6.9 out of 10, this is India's lowest score since the index began and discriminatory citizenship amendment acts suggest India's decline will continue in the 2020 index as well. India is a part of flawed democracies uh, but there have been noted improvements in some other countries including Bangladesh. So, why exactly has India gone down? Well, number one, it has a lot to do with Kashmir, Article 370 being removed, the internet ban taking place over there, a lot of leaders who have been arrested. Reason number two, the National Register of Citizens in Assam, which has excluded 1.9 million people. And reason three, uh, the new citizenship law has enraged the large Muslim population, stoked communal tensions and generated large protests in major cities. This is what the Economist's intelligence unit is saying. Now, I did speak to Kamal Nath, the Madhya Pradesh chief minister. He spoke about a lot of issues and the buzz about India this year, whether it was the same as it was last year. And I also asked him about this Economist survey, whether it matches some of the views of global CEOs that he's been speaking to. Let's listen in to this first interview interview. For several years, India has been a big buzz over here at the World Economic Forum in Davos. But this year, there are certain concerns. The International Monetary Fund has brought down India's GDP growth. And looking ahead, it appears that our economy is in a fair bit of trouble. Joining us now, the Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister, Mr. Kamal Nath. You've been here quite a few times in the past. I interviewed you last year as well. Before we look at the IMF, do you believe that that buzz around India is wearing off at the WEF? Well, over two decades I've uh, been seeing this forum and participating in it. Uh, there was a, Many years ago there was curiosity, there was anticipation, then there was participation. This time uh, it's damp. Mm. It's damp that enthusiasm over India is just not there. And I think it's, it's many issues. Mm. It's uh, the local domestic... Uh, political and social issues, mm. which people have asked me questions on among the meetings I've had. Mm. Um, what have they asked you and who's asked you, as, as an example? Well, so many uh, major CEOs, I don't want to take names, right. but they've asked me this question that... Uh, Are CEOs or CEOs of other countries? No, other countries. Right. That what is happening? What is this social in unrest going on, this student's problem? But the international press has carried this very widely. Yes. We must remember that. Yes. And they get very concerned about this because they looked at India as a very vibrant and uh, democracy, as the largest democracy. And now they see this. Uh, on the other hand, they are seeing an economy in distress. Hmm. They are seeing a banking system uh, which is in great difficulty. Hmm. Uh, you are seeing the medium and small sales hmm. uh, sector in great difficulty. Hmm. So obviously these are matters of concern to them where they were so, um, so hyped on India in the past. Hmm. Um, they... They asked them what's going wrong. Hmm. And uh, if we just look at the economy itself and what the IMF has said over here, 4.8% is what they've brought it down to. And they've said that global growth has been impacted by India. Uh, what, is, what are your own thoughts about that? I mean, is the India boom story, which is a boom story for all of us, uh, has it essentially gone bust in the near term? Of course it's gone bust. These figures and you'd are... use that word. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, you really believe that to be the case? Well, it's not. The Indian economy has not gone bust. The fact is that it is going down. Mm. It's a great disappointment. And India's uh, economy is a, is a big mass mm. in global GDP, mm. uh, in global growth. So when India starts shaking, uh, obviously it starts shaking global growth also. And that's what's happening. These figures which have come are not my figures, are not anybody else's figures. These are IMF figures. These are figures by very eminent uh, people who understand this. So this kind of uh, uh, results which are coming, uh, what's emerging out of India right now, 
is not a happy situation for India. Mr. Chidambaram uh, tweeted some time back saying that Geeta Gopinath better be uh, watchful for uh, attacks which are likely to come her way. Uh, is that a real worry that, you know, if, if for, for some people, if these numbers aren't numbers which they want to hear, then the numbers are wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you have a government which refuses to accept the reality, and if you have a government which thinks that every, the reality, whoever brings out the reality is an opponent, well, then... Uh, there's something really wrong with that government. Yeah. Let me give you the flip side also, because I've spoken to Wipro, I've spoken to the Mahindras, uh, I've spoken to some other Indian CEOs and MDs. They say that, look, let's not lose sight of the larger picture. Our demographics are very, very strong. The economy is bound to revive. Uh, these are cyclical issues, uh, and there may be an element of structural change which is required. Nobody is in denial, and this government is trying to bring in investment. Uh, so, you know, let's not give up hope. Uh, are they just bound to say that? Certainly we are not giving up hope. Um, nobody is giving up hope because India has the intellectual and uh, entrepreneurial abilities which perhaps no country has. Mm. Let's face that. Mm. So nobody is giving up hope. I have great confidence in Indian and in the Indian people. Mm. But the fact of the matter is that what one can deliver, what India should be delivering, it's not delivering. Right. And if you are going down from, you are trumpeting, Two years ago, this government uh, was trumpeting 7.5% growth, mm. and now you're struggling at 4 mm. odd percent. Mm. There, there's something really wrong. Yeah. And you were talking about Indian CEOs. I was with an Indian CEO yesterday mm. who said that his sales uh, in one area has gone down by 50% and another by 15%. Right. And um, when ministers like Mr. Goyal make statements saying that, look, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos isn't doing India any favors by investing a billion dollars in India. Now, there is a point that, you know, there is un uh, allegedly unfair competition, this, that, and the other. But these are issues which can be resolved. But if these statements are made, then what do global CEOs have to say who want to put money in India? Well, obviously, it sends the wrong signals. And uh, it sends wrong signals. And uh, I think uh, it's not good for. India's uh, image at all. Yeah. I don't know if you know about this, but I think just today morning, The Economist in its strategic outlook has brought down India's uh, strength in democracy by 10 ranks. India has lost 10 ranks. They've named the handling of Kashmir and they've named the NRC CA in it, NRC more than the CA. Uh, is this what you are also hearing now that, look, you're talking about the economy, but India's democracy is something we should perhaps be speaking about more at this juncture? Well, obviously, India was looked at as an example for democracy in the world, especially in the developing world. A uh, lot of countries had upheavals. Uh, uh, post-independence, their independence, but India was a country which was looked at as, a, as an example. And today, when the very foundation of uh, the Republic of India mm. are being shaken, uh, the preamble to the Constitution mm. uh, is shaky, is not being... Apparently, school kids in Maharashtra are now going to be deciding that. Yeah, well, school kids in, uh, in Madhya Pradesh are also going to be deciding, the, uh, deciding that from 26th of January. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Is, is that something that you've uh, that you've you've sought from from your education department? You yes, uh, I mean, uh, this is what it was their suggestion, right? That we should do this. I said yes, we must do it. Right. And it's going to be happening in Madhya Pradesh also. But coming back to the CA, the question is: one is the content of the CA and the NRC. The other question, and I think a very important question, is: what was the desperateness? Hmm. Are there refugees pouring in? Is there a war going on? What was the necessity? What was the desperateness? What was the need? Similarly for the NRC. You've got uh, the Aadhaar card. What's the need? You should be addressing issues of unemployment, economic distress, banking system, uh, agricultural uh, distress. You should be addressing those. But instead of addressing that, those, you are getting into something which is neither a priority yeah. Neither a desperate need. Yeah. So why are you doing that? Yeah. That's a logical question. Yeah. 
One last question to you. The opposition hasn't been particularly united on CA or NRC. Mamta Banerjee didn't attend that meet. Uh, I think Mayawati had problems as well. If you are going to make this an even bigger political issue, because now it's, it's peaceful protest, in most cases it's popular protest, uh, then without opposition unity, uh, a lot of people would say that, you know, I mean, these protests might just die down. So is that a concern for you, that, you know, you aren't talking the same thing with Mamta or the BSP? Well, they are talking the same thing. Everybody is talking but the same thing. they're not on the same platform. No, it's, you don't have to be sitting in a meeting to be saying that. They're all opposed to it. Yeah. That itself is the common platform. All right. So you don't be, have to be sitting together in a meeting and you say you didn't come to the meeting, so you are on a, uh, in a different orbit. That's not correct. They themselves, everybody is opposing it. Yeah. So if they don't come for a meeting, it doesn't mean that they've stopped opposing it. Right. All right, Mr. Kamalnath, I know it's getting cold. Thanks very much uh, for speaking to us. The Madhya Pradesh Chief Minister over there expressing his concerns about the economy, but also the political situation in the country at the moment. With Shitij Gupta, Vishnu Shom for NDTV. It's been a particularly challenging year for civil aviation, not just in India, but around the world. Uh, Ajay Singh of SpiceJet with us at this, say, at this stage. Thank you very much for speaking to us. When I spoke to you last year, there was a lot more optimism I felt as far as civil aviation in India was concerned. The mission Udan was coming along. All of those also exist at this stage. Uh, but are you a little bit despondent at this year? I'm not despondent because I think the uh, long-term outlook remains extremely bright. Uh, very, very few people fly in India. Clearly, that's going to change mm. uh, as incomes grow and as you know more flights become mm. available. Many, many more people are going mm. to fly. There's no question about mm. it. Uh, I think there has been a temporary setback uh, for the reason that, uh, you know, partly because of the fact that Boeing's uh, aircraft, the MAX, has yeah. uh, not been delivered as scheduled. Also, uh, problems with the Airbus aircraft, mm. uh, uh, with the Pratt & Whitney engine, mm. as well as, you know, delays in the delivery of the mm. 321 mm. Uh, new. Mm. So, uh, as a consequence of that, you know, there hasn't been that that uh, major uplift in, in capacity. Uh, and you've seen that in, in terms of the numbers mm. uh, of uh, uh, the growth numbers have slipped to yes. uh, the low single digit mm. digits. Uh, though I must say that uh, those numbers are somewhat misleading mm. because the fact that a lot of the capacity that's being deployed by the Indian civil mm. aviation sector at this time mm. is being deployed on international sectors, mm. you know, India going yeah. out of the country. And what we are measuring really is the domestic civil aviation mm. Uh, mm. scene, mm. flights within mm. the country. So I would think that the growth is still uh, closer to the high single digits, but right. uh, uh, I'm pretty confident that once the MAX comes back, once yeah. Airbus issues are resolved, yeah. uh, the uh, you know this growth is going to go back into the sure. double digits. Sure. Uh, you know, in f uh, financial terms, the MAX not operating, the fact that you needed that efficiency, besides anything else, besides the capacity, uh, for a low-cost carrier, how does a problem like that, which is unforeseen, uh, affect your operations? Well, it's it's uh, it's terrible. Uh, it's uh, you know when you plan that you will have a certain number of max aircraft, uh, more efficient aircraft, which uh, where the cost structure is uh, 10, 12 percent, 13 percent lower than the existing. Uh, there's no way to replace it here. So uh, what we've tried to do is to at least replace the capacity uh, and hope that the max comes back as soon as uh, as possible. Um, what if it course, doesn't? Uh, because uh, that, that's a possibility, it would be delayed. I mean, it's already being delayed. It is delayed, of mm. course. Uh, I think uh, it was grounded on the 15th of March in 2019, and uh, mm. nobody ever anticipated that it would be a whole one year later yes. that we're still talking about when it would be inducted mm. into service. So, of course, it's been delayed. It's been very painful. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will be compensated for some of the losses uh, by Boeing, mm. and uh, hopefully the aircraft can come back soon. Mm. Uh, I think uh, uh, Spicet needs that to happen and, uh, you know, uh, it's something which was completely unforeseen and uh, at this time we need to, uh, you know, provide whatever support we can to sure. Boeing to make sure that this can happen. There were also some reports that financially you were cash strapped. Um, in some cases, you, it could even have been a, a cash a, a cash and carry, uh, you know, in terms of flight operations. You pay for the fuel before flights could take place. Uh, are you that stressed at this stage? Not at all. I mean, you know, these in, in aviation, these things uh, will always go a little up and down. Uh, and uh, we were in a situation in 2014 where mm. operations were shut. Yeah. And uh, coming back from there and 
and you know we were in a pretty strong financial mm. uh, position and would have been in an, uh, in a really strong financial mm. position uh, but for the problem with the max mm. uh, i think those that problem will be resolved mm. there will be compensation for mm. for what has happened mm. uh, the extent of Possibly, that of yeah. course we don't know as yet but uh, but uh, you know the future is still bright yep uh, medium haul and long haul what are your plans well certainly medium haul uh, we are looking at it uh, at quite seriously we have started flights multiple flights mm. to saudi arabia for mm. example to hong kong uh, to bangkok what uh, about twin isle aircraft uh, twin isle aircraft is still a challenge we are looking at them we are looking at both the 787 dreamliner and the uh, a330 aircraft mm. from airbus uh, the numbers are still not stacking up uh, the risks are higher of course because mm. when you fly such a heavy aircraft uh, mm. from one place to the other you burn a lot of fuel mm. and and it's a, it's a high risk uh, business mm. uh, that high risk must be compensated with significant uh, gains mm. uh, at this time it doesn't uh, seem to me at least that uh, that's uh, really happening mm. but we are still working on it mm. and uh, uh you know eventually the we as as airlines and uh, india as a country will have to find some way of making this work because yeah. you know uh, for 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 decades we've been saying that it's completely wrong for us to take our passengers mm. have them hub out mm. outside mm. out of uh, dubai mm. and abu dhabi mm. and and uh, doha and mm. singapore and bangkok and, mm. and 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 from there uh, for those people to mm. be distributed by foreign carriers we need mm. to build our own hubs and take our passengers yeah. directly from here yeah. in fact we need to be getting passengers into india and mm. then distributing them from from uh, these wonderful uh, indian airports yeah. uh, and and that needs to happen so we need to actually brainstorm a lot more and figure a way to make this happen i think over time But low cost would be your model for uh, in case you expand uh, certainly i think you know uh, no business class uh, no, first no class. you know I mean, it depends it we are looking at 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 a limited uh, business class mm. on the longer haul flights mm. Uh, mm. because uh, there is a certainly a demand even from our passengers and mm. our customers uh, for that to happen so we we are looking at at a bit of a hybrid model there mm. but it's uh, still a little premature right one final question uh, safety it's the biggest concern in the indian skies now uh, you of course are with uh, our spice jet but uh, a lot of the other airlines which operate the a320 have had problems is going forward does safety remain a huge concern for you the the skies are crowded there are technical failings which have taken place boeing and airbus for passengers where does that leave us i think uh, there's nothing more important there can't be i mean no. just imagine mm. one one uh, uh, one crash in mm. in india would mm. would completely have turned the sector so mm. there is no question that remains the, the 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 most important thing i think uh, uh, the regulators and the airlines are being exceedingly cautious mm. uh, india has one of the best safety records mm. uh, in the world uh, and we need to ensure that uh, that uh, we can maintain that uh, and uh, Uh, you know the manufacturers as well i think they need to work uh, twice as hard to make sure that uh, these kind of problems cannot occur right. i think once the max comes back into service it it will be the probably the safest aircraft in the world with the kind of scrutiny yeah. uh, and and rightfully so mm -hmm. the kind of scrutiny that it's going through at this time yeah thank you very much sir for speaking to us thank there you have it mr ajay singh talking about all aspects of aviation in the country the the, the financial aspect the safety aspect and of course his plans for the future For many the World Economic Forum meet in Davos, Switzerland is all about innovation. Yes, it's about big leaders. Yes, it's about powerful people. But there is that sense of innovation as well. And I think very few people exemplify that sense of of courage in in getting serious innovation happening more uh, than Asha Motwani Jadeja. She joins us now. Asha, you run the Motwani Jadeja Foundation. and one of the things that you've done is that you have invested a lot of your own money uh, into startups which you believe have a real future when did you start doing this uh, and which areas do you focus on so actually to be honest this was started by uh, my late husband professor yeah. who is an iitian right and a, a, a fantastic iitian at that yeah alumni of iit kanpur but also a stanford faculty and the brains uh, behind stanford he was the first few authors of uh, the stanford of the google paper yeah. that was written by rajiv larry sergey and a couple of the faculty members so so Ra this was rajiv's brain child i think first few investments that we made in uh, paypal stumble upon uh, miraki networks and a whole bunch of other companies some of them which have gone public by now they were a lot of them were made by my uh, late husband yeah. and i was part of that investment process after that uh, after rajiv's uh, you know passing actually we as a family 
We've invested in at least over 100 companies, tech companies in Silicon Valley, and we are just beginning to invest in India, and we have about 12 companies in the portfolio now, including things like Yulu Bikes, EdHack, uh, NapNap, uh, Your Dost, right. and a whole bunch of companies in India. And uh, yeah, so I, yeah. We're, we are really... And, and what is the value of the investments that you've done? It obviously depends on the venture, but what are some of the biggest uh, sums of money that you've contributed as, as a VC? So I would say there are two things, right? One is as a professional venture capitalist, we invest anywhere from zero to $10 million, even at a series A stage. But as a personal angel investor, I invest anywhere from you know $100,000 to a million. So my, uh, I would say one of my sort of million dollar investments was in a company called Guinea Bee, mm -hmm. which is based in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, the size of my India investments is anywhere from, I would say $25,000 to about a, a half, half a million dollars. Right. In, uh, in Indian startups. And I'm super excited about Indian companies. I think India is probably going to be on the forefront of the quantum frontier. Right. And for the first time in the history of Davos, we are bringing quantum computing depth yeah. by, uh, you know, uh, actually sort of powered sure. by Stanford. But Asha, you've written a letter to the Prime Minister as well, which yes. I've had a chance to look at, uh, that there needs to be more done by the government of India in recognizing you Indian unicorns and startups, and then putting them up on the stage of Davos. That's not happened, has it? It has never happened. And uh, I am trying to put some pressure, you know, positive and not so positive pressure on the Indian bureaucratic system there to say the face of India has to be people like Nandan Nilakani, the Flipkart founders, the Paytm. That's what the world is looking for. The world is looking to invest in India because there are founders of uh, Paytm and Flipkart in India, you know, and then Mintra and a whole bunch of other fantastic companies. Yeah. People want to see those people in Davos. And I, I, I really request the Indian government to please put those faces as the face of India in Davos. Yeah. And what I found really interesting in terms of who you've selected to fund is that it's not just AI people, it's not just people with a particular vision, you are uh, investing in ideas. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, and the ideas are across the board, so you aren't aiming on anything specific in any one area. Uh, I am actually. So there are two kind of investments I'm making, uh, Vishnu. One is uh, investing in tech companies. Tech companies is largely AI, ML, and quantum. That's what I'm investing today. That's what I'm investing in right now. That's for profit, heavy for profit, uh, straight out shooting for a thousand x returns kind of investments. Uh, that I'm doing as a bread and butter job of my venture capital mm. self. Okay. The other investing I'm making is more impact investing. Mm. So things like, for example, your dose is a mental health company. Right. That is, uh, is, is I would say, is more of an impact company. Mm. Yulu Bikes, I think, is a, I would say, for me, is a learning experience right now in seeing how e-bikes will do in Bangalore. Right. And it is actually applying beautifully in Bangalore right now, and I'm thrilled with that investment. We also have two companies, which are, uh, you know, baby product companies. One is NapNap, and the second one is Cradlewise, which are out of Bangalore. And uh, these companies are clearly something different, but for me, Investing in those companies war, was with the hope of uh, bringing maternal health mm -hmm. into a more, uh, more safe, into a more safer realm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, look, this is all fascinating stuff, and I'd like to thank you very much uh, for most, speaking to me. And welcome. it's absolutely fascinating. Most and uh, welcome, yes. you know, I mean, somebody who has the vision to want others to succeed in in the manner that uh, that that you have, it's truly remarkable. And it's the it it really is the highlight, in a sense, of the spirit of innovation and invention, yes. which uh, Davos really has been about in the past. Thanks and, very and much. And go India. A and go India. Go right? India. Absolutely. Right. India, there you have it. Vishnu, India is a rocket ship. Don't let anybody question that ever again. It is a rocket ship. We need to know that, and we must never forget that. All right, Asha, thanks Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, it's time now for us to take a short break. We'll be back tomorrow again at 10 p.m. with our continued special interviews and focus at the World Economic Forum in Davos. With Shitej Gupta, Vishnu Shom for NDTV.